where we talk nothing but tactics. I love it. Just tactics, no strategy, no vision. And why do we do that? You know, I actually get that question once in a while. Why do you do that? And the answer is pretty straightforward because there's a lot of other shows that do that and you should go listen to them because those are done by really smart people. Um, my whole goal when I do this thing, and hopefully this is why you're here, and hopefully you spread the love with your sales colleagues, is I want you to be marginally better, 1% marginally better after listening to every single episode. I want you to take away one piece of advice. And what's interesting is, you know, that's my goal for you. But the truth is, with every single show, when I talk to these really smart people about how to approach sales and business development, I myself am also getting marginally better. It's, it's amazing how much I learn. And it's not always something I've learned. It's something that I've been reminded of, that I've known and I've just forgot to do. And this is the fact. This is what we're all guilty of, right? Because we all have read the books. We all know what's going on. We've all watched videos. We're all on LinkedIn. We're watching all the various influencers out there sharing their insights. We're commenting on them. Just in the last 24 hours, I was on this whole conversation, which is, so this is totally related about how I'm learning. I was on a conversation that my good friend Luigi, I'm going to get it wrong, Prestini? Anyway, he's out of uh, the Australia, New Zealand area. Uh, wonderful guy. He's got uh, the Sales IQ podcast. Luigi is out there talking about researching and that uh, you have to research every call. And uh, check out his posts and you'll see what I'm talking about. And he basically says, do you agree, yes or no? And uh, you get the usual, what I call sycophants, and that's nothing meant to disparaging, uh, although it probably does sound disparaging, where it's like, yeah, uh-huh, you go, Luigi. Yeah, brother, yeah, love it. Yeah, I got to research. And hey, I, you know, research is good. Um, I have a different point of view. And so my answer, uh, and my point of view is not unique, um, but my answer was, well, it depends. Is this for a sales development rep who's making the call or is this for an account exec? Because if it's for an account exec, then yeah, I agree with you. But if it's for a sales development rep, then no, I, I don't agree with you. I don't believe you should research. And so we had this back and forth. And the back and forth really came down to two points of view. And, and I'm, I'm not going to try to persuade you to take my side or take his side, but I will present the different points of view. Luigi's intent is admirable, which is the research is going to help you connect with them because you're going to understand their pains. And I fully agree with that. My point of view is the role of an SDR is fundamentally that you simply are taking either marketing qualified leads or a list that sales has generated and you're reaching out to them to see if it's a fit. And then you're setting up an appointment for the AE. Based on that, there's an assumption. And Luigi and I got in a conversation around named accounts. So let's use that as our discussion. In fact, I want to give full credit. Luigi was commenting on the original post, which was posted by Morgan Ingram. So you, you want to find the post, go to Morgan Ingram. He's the one who posted it. Anyway, his, his point was, well, you know, you can research because they're named accounts. My point was, listen, if they're named accounts, that means there's a filter that's gone in to create that list. That means you've gone, you've said, I'm going to specifically target this vertical with you know these aspects maybe they have salesforce installed and they have marketo installed and they have something else installed of uh, this size uh in this geography and i'm looking for anybody with this persona this title you know we'll say uh director vp or c, or c level marketing title i'm making this all up on the fly and the reason you do that filter for those named accounts is because you know your solution addresses very specific points experience that 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 specific filter that industry those titles that size company uh, are facing they have probably what I like to say is symptom a symptom B and symptom C they have those pain points and you have a solution that can address symptom a and symptom B and symptom C if we accept that premise, the SDR making the call is going to then go and say, hey, do you have symptom A? Do you have symptom B? Do you have symptom C? Great. We have a, a cure that will make your life better. 
let me introduce you so you're going to put an appointment with the AE. If they say no to A, no to B, and no to C, then they say, great, have a great day, make the next call. The SDR isn't researching every single lead in my example. So that's the point of view I took. That's the point of view Luigi took as far as you do the research. Two different camps. Here's the question. What do Luigi and I both have in common? What we have in common is we're both articulating how we go about prospecting. What is our prospecting plan? Now imagine my surprise. When this morning I get out of bed, I go to my inbox, and at 5.05 a.m., I have an email from Mark the Sales Hunter, one of the four horsemen, you know, one of the key guys behind the Outbound Conference. And it's called, How Do I Build a Prospecting Plan? So, as you all know, Mark is never doing anything. He's never busy. He's, never, he's, just, he's just hanging out waiting for Daryl to call him. So I reached out to him and said, Mark, let's talk about how do I build a prospecting plan? Let's talk about your very blog posts where you have eight steps that you can do right now and let's share those insights. And maybe along the way, you can offer some insight in this fight that Luigi and I are having, this disagreement, and, uh, and we can share our collective knowledge to help my audience ah, be marginally 1% better when this episode is done than they were when they began. With that all said, let me welcome to the show. Mark Hunter. Mark, hey, how you doing, man. Thank you for having me on the show. <sighs> I missed you. How you how you been keeping? I've been I've been busy. I was up in your fair country yesterday. I was up in Toronto. Or you know, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing it the way you Ottawans. I don't know what what do you call somebody from Ottawa? An Ottawa would work, or an or, or you can say loser. That's also you know, oh like a, man, you know? man, or you know, uh, what would, what's another a patriot because it's our nation's capital. How's that? Well, and 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 your country does hold the NBA trophy this year. We so. do hold the. And okay. did you did you see any Raptors gear? I uh, saw way too much Raptors gear. But as I walked past each one of those stores, I reminded the store owner that we do have the Stanley Cup. So. <laughs> You do have the standing up. This is true. And again, though, a large portion of the people on that team were Canadian. I'm seeing a trend here. Just want to say that. A large portion? They're all. They're all. They're all. Canadian. If it makes you feel any better, a large portion of the Raptors were American. So there we go. We were just excited we had some Canadians on the team. All right. You came out with how to build a prospecting plan. What was the catalyst behind this? I mean, because, you know, you are a best selling author. You're, a, 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 I mean, you're just a prolific speaker. You work with a lot of clients. You've been doing this for a few years. You're, you might have a gray hair too. It denotes some tenure and some experience. I won't say you're old because that would just be rude, although accurate. Um, what is it you see that people are doing? I mean, I'm going to take it. Either you don't see them building a prospecting plan or they're not doing it well. Well, I see them doing both. A, the vast majority of salespeople don't have a prospecting plan, or if they do have one, it's a plan that somehow they think is going to work. The big challenge is prospecting doesn't have to be complicated. If you get the right roadmap set up, go back to what you and Luigi were have been going back and forth about. And it really comes down to understanding who your customer is. And that, that was really the, the, the first piece I, I, I say that you've got to understand who's your perfect client. Because if, if what you're doing is a short sale is just, you know, a, a rapid engagement, I don't have to do research. Now, on the other hand, if I'm selling Boeing aircraft, I got to do a lot of research. So uh, what I want to do is I want to put together a plan that any salesperson can walk through these eight steps, do them, boom, boom, boom. And then they're very comfortable to pick up the phone and make the call. And the first step is, do you know who your perfect client is? Get very tight, get very focused. And you actually go one step further. It's not, a, and, I, and I like this because you actually give some very pragmatic tactical advice where you say, take some time to write out a description of your perfect client. I, I don't know if any sales rep I know themselves have taken time to write it out. They usually look for it to be handed to them by marketing, by sales leadership, or what have you. Um, so why that advice? As well, opposed, why not just have somebody give it to you? Yeah, it's because when you, when you have it given to you, it, it doesn't really sink into your brain. But when you take it and, and, and you sit down and, and, and you write it or you put it into your computer, 
it, it's amazing that you're going through the thought process as to why is this, why is this the perfect client? Who is this? And what I always say is, is look at your previous clients. Who have been the clients that you've done work with before? What do they look like? What, it, what are they all about? And it's amazing when you go through that process, you begin to create this visual picture, this visual image of who it is that you want to be prospecting. And when you have that visual image, it's amazing how much more real it becomes when you're picking up the phone and calling them. And I really do like that. I like that how you're, you're really connecting with them on a real tangible level because you're being almost ta uh, ta tactical, if you will, yes. or yeah. there's a, in the sense of how you, the tact, the, the, uh, the I'm trying to, I'm, I'm stammering for words, the whole tactile, that's the word, the whole tactile nature of a pen writing out on paper where you have to be intentional about your thoughts because you're writing the word about the attributes your ideal customer profile consists of really allows you to get into the head of that. Now, what I like to do with teams is I like to say, okay, so if you're on a sales team, uh, two or more of you are targeting the same ideal customer profile, to your point, the perfect client, individually have them go down and write down what that ICP looks like and then compare notes. Because I'll bet often there's a different point of view. Do you see that often? Yes, I do. And see, this is, this is what's healthy about it. So now I get these different points of view. And what it does, it allows us to really become convicted as to who we believe the best client is. And when we become convicted, it's amazing how much more in tune we are in terms of knowing, hey, I know I can help them. You have to, in order to be successful in sales, have ownership in the customer you're trying to turn into the customer. And it starts here by knowing who is your perfect client. Now, you, you, you then kind of carry on that tactile experience where you first you say, you know, know who your client is and it takes some time to write out the description of it. Then you go and do another tactile exercise, which is you say, step number two, create, create a list of the outcomes you you create and you get some very specific advice here about what that list is and is not. So maybe you can elaborate. Yeah. It's not features. It's not that this is what everybody already said. Oh, well we did. I don't care. I don't care. It's what is the outcome you create? You may sell software. Okay. We'll say that you sell software and it allows an organization to be more productive. Well, what does that productivity mean? What does that productivity mean? It means that, they're able to get more revenue per employee. They're able to satisfy more customers. They're able to expand their reach. That's where I want to get. What is the outcome? And, and when you begin focusing in on the outcome that the customer receives, it, it does two things. A, you're now thinking the way the customer is thinking. But B, I think it jazzes you because you're now seeing how what you sell is not what you sell, but it's why you sell because of your ability to help them achieve. You know, my definition of sales is helping you see and achieve what you didn't think was possible. See, so you may, you may be a company and you're trying to increase revenue per employee. Well, this is what the software system that we provide, we sell, allows you to do. You're going to be able to get more productivity per employee. Perfect. And I, I love that you took out kind of that, that benefit and you mapped it back to, to to business value. Now, the challenge is that, especially in the sales development role, less so in the account executive role, um, we don't have enough life experience to do that mapping. So how does a young sales professional entering the field do that step that you say is so important to do? Well, what, what happens is you're not probably going to know this if you're first coming in. But it kind of goes to this, this third step that I have in the list. And that is, you know, build a, 10, build a list of 10 questions that will engage the prospect and allow them to share with you their critical needs. So all I have to do is start asking prospects questions as I'm on the phone with them. And they're going to paint, they're going to take me to their critical points. They're going to take me to their critical needs. And their critical needs, ah, those become the outcomes. See, so really, if you start thinking about it, 
the whole eight step process I've outlined is a little bit of a circle. It's not a straight line. Uh, the more you go through it, the more, more you, you learn, back. the more you learn, the more you apply. And, and what happens is you, you're able to move faster and faster and faster. See, this is what's key. Uh, so many people start off and they have all this wonderful stuff that they want to share. Well, I'm sorry, but Daryl, if you were to call me up and just start spouting off, um, I'd hang up on, well, I hang up on you all the time. Anyway, <laughs> that, 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 that's a whole separate. You're not the first. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, um, but it, it, it's, I've got to engage. See, so, you know, it's not that I'm going to ask you 10 questions. Oh, I have 10 questions. I no, no. But what I found is, if I have a list of 10 questions I'm comfortable asking, I'm going to be really comfortable asking one or two. And the whole thing about having 10 questions is it's like having a lot of food in the refrigerator. If you know you have a lot of food in the refrigerator, it's amazing how much more comfortable you feel because you're not going to go hungry. I want to have that list and it allows me to be ready. And are those questions specific? Because the classic you want to ask open-ended questions so that they'll talk. Well, they're open-ended, but they're specific to their industry, to their needs. See, go, go back to the whole perfect client. Who's the perfect client? So what's the perfect client dealing with? What are the issues? What are the challenges I see? Okay, now I may not know that specifically yet, but I'm going to get as specific as I can. And the questions are going to be as specific as I can. And oh, by the way, remember, this is a circle. So the more questions I ask, guess what? The more I'm going to learn what's working, what's not working, what's working, what's not working. All right. So you, we, we left talking about the list of 10 questions that you're going to engage with them and that you, know, you probably won't ask all of them and you'll refine them and you'll improve them. And you have that comfort level knowing you've got all 10 questions if they're the kind of individual that gives one word answers. Um, so that's kind of cool. But then you go on to step four and you talk about creating a list of value added statements and insights you can share with prospects during the prospecting phase. You know, often I'll, I'll almost lead every email I send with a results statement right away. You know, it's an insight. Um, this is step four, which is logical because you're setting up the conversation, which is going to happen fast and furious. Help me understand the difference of value added statements versus questions. Well, really, you're going to be able to interchange them quite a bit. But what I like to have is I like to have this list of value added statements because I may have one conversation with you and uh, it doesn't go anywhere. How do I stay in touch? Well, boom, if I've got this list of value added statements, insights and questions, I'm prepared that I can, I can send you off another email. I can leave you another voicemail. I can just keep, I can keep coming and coming and coming at you because there's no way is one phone call is ever going to make it happen. But now guess what? I'm ready. And I can keep coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. Because we lose far too many deals because we do not remain engaged with our prospects long enough to get them talking to us. And this is what step four is all about. And I do like that. So let's just have, let me make sure I'm clear on this. Is the value add statement kind of that hook we're using to get to the conversation where we can ask her 10 questions? Yes, yes, it is, it is. Uh, I, I'm going to share with you a value added statement or something like that. That is all it's designed to do is to get you to say, wow, I do really want to talk to Daryl. I, I do really need to pick up the phone and call Mark. Or next time Mark calls, next time Daryl calls, I'm going to take that call because they're providing me insights. Remember, the first piece was who's, who's the profile? Who is the perfect customer? See, all these insights are geared around what's a value to them, not a value to you. So what I got out of that was that you want to talk to Daryl. That's really all I heard. Uh, no, not really, but that's, we'll leave that for your mother. <laughs> all right. So you did the value added statement that led to scheduling time to have an appointment. And now we're on to step five, block the necessary time on the calendar to be able to prospect, I guess, I'm sorry, I guess I'm jumping ahead of myself. Before we get the appointment, you're, you're actually saying be intentional on blocking the time on your calendar to be able to prospect. <laughs> yeah, you do. Oh man, thinking about prospecting is not prospecting. And oh, by the way, oh, oh, well, you know, we, we, we'll just go ahead and uh, uh, I'll prospect as soon as I get done with everything else. Guess what? You won't. Unless you put it on your calendar. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I ate yesterday. I used the restroom yesterday. I showered yesterday. There are certain things that I never not do. 
prospecting has to be one of them. So you got to put, you got to block the time on the calendar to make it happen. So this kind of circles back a little bit to, you know, an indirect correlation to the point I was making with Luigi about research. I find a lot of people don't block the time because they want it said block the time to research. And they're, what they're really doing is they're avoiding the call. Oh, that's oh, so true. So true. This is prospecting time is when you're engaged with the prospect, not preparing, not researching. Uh, it's doing it, having the engagement with the prospect. So, you know, you've made this point, but I want to under, underline this. You, you say here, you have to realize that this is as, as important as eating or using the restroom. So this is not just, this is not just a habit. This is as mission critical, and if you don't do it, the dire outcome of that action is no different than not using the facilities. The dire outcome is bad. Salespeople have shoeless kids. <laughs> that is a tweetable moment. Okay, so the, but but, but you're way, right. They they, yeah. they have kids with no shoes because they're not doing it. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? The reason you're doing this is to be successful at your job. And if you're successful at your job, you're going to make money. And you, if you can give any excuse you want to, but if you don't, you're not going to make any money. There you go. There All right. Go. So I've learned I should do this. All right. With each pro now step number six here, with each prospecting block of time, be sure to have a goal. Oh, please. Talk to about that. What does that mean? Please, please. You've got to have goals in terms of what you need to do is you okay. what are the number of calls I intend to make during this prospecting block? I want to always have a set of goals because remember we're in sales because we love to measure things. And along with that measuring thing is I've got to stop and evaluate myself after I got done prospecting. Hey, how did I do? How did I do? What, what do I need to change? What, how is this, what can I learn to help me be even better on the next prospecting block? Never go into a prospecting block, not knowing what you're going to do and never come out of it not evaluating what you've done. All right. Step seven, you start to get a little bit, um, what's the word? Less specific. You talk about, this is, this is actually very soft. You talk about your attitude. So I do all these steps that you've said, but you're very specific. But in the end, it's a soft aspect, not a tactical, pragmatic, specific aspect. Your attitude is what will make or break you. Well, yeah, because at, at the end of the day, if uh, I can make phone calls two ways. I can make phone calls with a bad attitude or I can make phone calls with a great attitude. And let me tell you something right now. If you don't believe, this is, goes back to steps one and two, who's your perfect client, what's the outcome? If you don't believe in the outcomes that you can help people with, you're never gonna have a good attitude because you don't believe you're making the calls for a reason. When you truly believe that the phone calls you make, when you truly believe that you can make a difference in people because the outcomes you can help them with, you owe it to them to get in touch with them. You owe it to them. You, anything, not, anything short of that is literally failing, not yourself, it's failing you, but it's failing them because you failed to reach out to them. And, and, and that really, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna jump ahead to, to step eight, which is never give up. You see this whole thing, you've got to be persistent. So many salespeople fall short. Well, I called them twice and they didn't respond. I called them three times, they didn't respond. Hey, if you can make it, keep going. And the only reason you're gonna keep going is because of your attitude. It's amazing, every one of us every day have opportunities presented to us. The vast majority of people never see them, because their attitude is blocking up. There's nothing to be learned here. There's nothing to be gained here. So Have the right I, attitude. It's amazing what changes. So, and people, so Mark's using the word attitude. I've heard many people also refer to this as mindset. Uh, so both equally applicable. So your eight course uh, recipe for how to build a prospecting plan is, you know, step one, Make sure you write down who your perfect client is. Be very specific about that. Compare your notes if you want to with your, your colleagues to see how you, you know, compare and get you know, consistency and consensus. Step two, create a list of the outcomes that you physically, your solution creates. Not talking features or benefits, talking about how you help the customer with what you sell. 
Step three, build that list of 10 questions that will engage the prospect and allow them to share with you their critical need. Step four, create a list of value added statements and insights you can share with prospects during the prospecting phase, huge. Step five, block the time on your calendar to be able to prospect, all right? You gotta do that. Um, step six, when you're in that block of time, have a goal, you know, so that you can uh, celebrate the victories and then keep the momentum going. Uh, and then set, but part of that as well, always evaluate what you learn and how it helps you improve. So continual, continual improvement. Step seven, it's all about your mindset and your attitude. You've gotta have the right mindset and the right attitude. In other words, I believe in my solution. If I get rejected, it's not a rejection of me, it's a rejection of this solution. Uh, but again, going back to learning from this, maybe I didn't present it right, well enough, so maybe I refine that. But again, it's about the right attitude. You know, oh, look at, I learned something that's a win. Even though I got rejected, I learned something that's a win. Keep it going. Step eight, never give up, be persistent. And if you have struggle with, you struggle with being persistent for whatever things, this is where I would say you need to buy Vanilla Soft because we'll help you with that. That's what we're all about. Uh, that's my little plug for Vanilla Soft. Uh, Mark, what are you up to these days? Where are you speaking? Got any books happening? Should I buy something? Have you written something in the last couple of weeks? You're always freaking writing. I'm always writing. I would probably write three, 4,000 words a week. Hey, my new book is, it. we can now officially talk about it, A Mind for Sales. A Mind for Sales. That's my next book. Harper Collins is my publisher, and that'll be releasing in the first quarter of 2020. A Stay Mind for Sales. A lot now, more news on that one. That's going to be, a, that really is a great book. We just got done writing the manuscript about two weeks ago. I love it. And, and did you go to the other three horsemen to help you write that? Or hey, the, the other three horsemen are in there. And of course, we got Outbound coming up next year, the week of May 5th. And oh, guess what? We're taking it to the next level. It's getting even bigger. Yes. And if you haven't sales, been to Outbound. Sales, sales is fun. That, sales that is, is fun. Yeah. Outbound is like one of the preeminent events you guys need to go to. If you, if you have a budget to go to shows, if I can make any one recommendation, I'm not saying this just because Mark is here in the podcast right now. Okay, maybe it's influencing it a little bit. Outbound is definitely one you have to hit. It is, it a, is a mind-blowing. Experience. It is a mind-blowing. Everybody walks away from that going, wow. Um, so, you know, if you want to develop your craft, that's the way to go. But – if you want to mine for sales, Q1 next year. In the meantime, whilst you wait for that one, Mark has several other books. Your favorite bookseller, Amazon, whatever you want to check him out. You can, Mark, what's the best way to reach you, sir? Well, the website is thesaleshunter.com. You know, thus, and yes, Hunter is my real last name. No, I did not change it. It's you embraced my, it. It's the sales hunter. So the hey, you know, I guess it comes that I was just born to be in sales. It's. <laughs> You're definitely born to be a hunter. We know that for yeah, a fact. And, and, and because people were trying to rip off my name, I actually had to trademark it. So the sales hunter is trademarked. So. Trademark. So you have to say that. The sales hunter, trademark. Trademark. And me, you know, just like that. Um, so one last thing you need to know, guys. He is very active on social media. What I like with Mark, he does something a little different from other influencers. He actually does a lot of video work, but his videos are like 10 seconds long. You know, I'm, I'm, and so you get a, a, a nugget in a hurry. Now, I'm still working with him on captioning his videos, but they're like 10 seconds long. So turn the video sound on quickly, listen, and then turn it back off again. That's it. I should, I should add captions. You're right. Should but I add do captions. them so rapidly when I'm dashing through an airport. I know. You're multitasking. That's my life. That's my life. We're out of time, folks. It's another episode in the books. If you like this show, stay tuned. We're going to be back next week and doing it again. My name is Daryl Prell. I am with Inside, Inside Sales. <laughs>